Good morning, and welcome to another program of Study the Word. This is sponsored every week by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at the corner of Big Ben and Guyer Road right there in Kirkwood. Folks, we'd love to have you come and assemble with us. You'd be our honored guest. We have that website put up there for you to go to to find our location, if you're not familiar with the area, and our times of services. This program is called Study the Word, which means we deal with Bible questions. And in just a few moments, we're going to be dealing with this, this week's Bible question, which is, can churches vote on what they will teach as far as what is right and what is wrong? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in just a few moments. We hope you'll stay tuned. So speaking of Bible questions, maybe you have one on your mind. We'd love to deal with it on this program. You call that number? You can text your question or leave it on voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. We're so thankful for all the uh, calls that we have been receiving. Uh, we're so glad that our viewers are participating in this weekly program. I'll put that phone number up again at the end of the program. Every week we offer a number of free Bible study helps. We'll put it up again. All right, so where do we begin with when we start talking about does the church or do churches vote? on what they want to teach as far as what's morally right or what's morally wrong, um, or other doctrinal issues. Now, this, this isn't too far-fetched because I remember uh, a number of years ago, I was talking with somebody about some spiritual matters, of, and they said to me, well, on that particular issue, Chuck, we, uh, our church is going to vote on that next week. And I thought that's rather odd, but let, let's... Look at that in light of what the Bible has to say. Can churches, you know, they, they come together uh, as a congregation, and can they vote as to what that church is going to stand for, what they'll, what they'll agree to be right and what they agree to be wrong? All right. First, when it comes to religious groups today, we know what goes on. And I'm not here to say that these religious groups can't do that. They can do whatever they want. I'm not here to legislate to them that you can't uh, vote on some particular issue and your church stand for it or stand against it. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about what does the Lord say and what is the church to do that belongs to him? I mean, people can call themselves a church all they want. Um, we like to quote the passage there in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, where those Christians were told, you have a name that's alive, but you're really dead. So people can call themselves anything they want. They can call themselves a Christian. They can call themselves a church. But what we're talking about today is the church that Jesus established. Remember, we, we, we talked about this so many times if, a, if you've been a regular viewer. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And the fact, fact of the matter is Colossians. The key to all this is Colossians chapter 1, in verse 18, Paul says to the church at Colossae, he says, and he, talking about Jesus, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning from the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So we're talking about Jesus establishing his church, his special people, which he's the head of. Now, when you have a group of people that come together as a church, and that's what happens, Christians, those who obey the gospel according to what the Bible teaches, and we've had programs on that. What are the steps to become a child of God? People need to learn what the Bible teaches, not what some organization voted on or decided what would be uh, the requirements to become a Christian, but what does the Bible actually have to say about that? That's the key. So what we're talking about is Christians coming together as Paul addressed the church at Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, dealing with an issue that arose in that local congregation, said, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. 
First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Now, we know that the church is to be united, okay? They, they, they need to agree. And Paul addressed that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, where he says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So is this a passage that is teaching us that when Christians come together, they can vote. And when they're all in agreement on something, then it must be okay. Well, that's not what this verse says. Because this verse started out by saying, I plead with you, brethren, by the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ, you all speak the same thing. Speak what thing? Things that they decide to believe? You know, when you, when you read, we'll just take the church at Corinth, for example. This church could decide to do whatever it wants to do. It doesn't mean it's right. You know, when, you, when we think about the problem that Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you have to ask yourself, well, Paul, that's none of your business. Just let the church at Corinth do whatever they decided to do. No. Because look what he says. Here was the problem, by the way, that he was addressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He went on to say in verse 20, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. Should have been, but it wasn't. He says, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? And shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Well, what? Well, he says that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what was happening here? Well, for some reason, this church had decided to turn the Lord's Supper into a meal, a feast. Well, what's, the, what's wrong with that? Let's just let them do whatever they want. I mean, if they're going to come together and do it for the Lord, isn't that, the, isn't that the whole point? You can come together and worship God any way that you want as long as that congregation agrees. I mean, that's what you have that's being offered out there to the public. These religious groups are saying, come, come and be with us. We're, we're more progressive or we provide this particular entertainment or we provide that. And the reason why they exist in the first place is because you have that particular group agreeing with it. But does that make it right? No, it, it doesn't make it right. But, I mean, you, you can find groups that will teach anything that you want, which Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 by saying, Timothy, you need to preach the word. He said that in verse 2. And the reason why he told him to preach that word is because in verses 3 and 4 he says, well, you know, there'll come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heap up, heap up for themselves te teachers having itching ears, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Well, if, if they all agree in this particular fable, isn't there unity? Aren't they speaking the same thing? Aren't they perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment? Well, they are united, and they are believing and speaking the same thing, but not with God's approval. See, that's why this program is called Study the Word. And so when somebody asks the question, well, can churches vote on what they are to believe and what they are not to believe as far as considering false doctrine, we need to understand that the church doesn't have a say in the matter. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about the church that's, that's Christ. I'm not talking about these religious groups. They can do whatever they want, and they do. But our program, what we're trying to get people to do is go back and study the Word of God and see what it has to say about it. What did, what did God say about that? Well, when a church comes together, 
They better listen to the head, who is Jesus. He has all the authority. So when you look at that, by the way, that's Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. If Jesus has all the authority, how much authority does the church have? You can't say some. If you say some, then Jesus doesn't have all the authority. And Jesus did not transfer that authority to somebody else. He didn't give me any authority, so that's why I'm supposed to go and preach the gospel. If I preach a different gospel, I'm to be accursed. And so is anybody else that preaches another gospel. That's Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. So churches do not have the right to come together and decide on whatever they want as far as a doctrinal matter. And that's what they were doing here. They were turning the Lord's Supper into a meal. The ends does not justify the means. If we sit there and say, well, we're going to worship God any way that we want because it's still worship. No, because John 4 verse 24 says there's such thing as worship that's not in spirit and truth. We're supposed to be in spirit and truth, but some do not do it with their heart in it. Some don't do it according to the truth. And Matthew chapter 15 verses 7 through 9 points out there's such thing as vain empty worship, which, by the way, which was happening at Corinth. They were coming together, yes, but not for the better, but for the worse. In their minds, it was for the better because they were doing what they wanted to do. We don't have the right to do what we, ever, what we want to do when it comes to worship. Let's consider something on the negative side. What if a church embraces error? I mean, they did in that case too, but I, I'm talking about where they know something is sinful but they, they as a church decided not to do anything about it. I've, I've heard of that happening. You know, religious groups are saying, you know, if there's people that are living in sin, we're just going to ignore it. Um, none of our business. Well, no, the local church is to be the pillar and the ground of truth. And if you go over to there to Ephesians chapter 5, I think you're reading about verses 27 and, and 28. Let me just go over there quickly because... Jesus wants his church to be without blemish. Listen to how he put it here. He says, um, verse 25 of Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now remember, the church are the people, not some building. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it. What's the it? The church. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. No, we, we don't get to vote on something. Now, let me give you an example where they were ignoring sin within the congregation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says in verse 1, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. He says, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. He went on and talked about how that they need to take care of this problem in verse 4 and in verse 5 in order to save the person. You don't ignore when somebody's walking in sin. Congregations now, these religious groups, they're, they're not wanting to be specific about calling what sin really is. You keep things general and people are comfortable with that. But when you get very specific, people get uncomfortable and local churches don't want that to happen. You start pointing out error, you become a troublemaker. And people, want, people want to have unity, quote, unity within the religious groups by agreeing to disagree or they might vote on some particular issue. Now that's what's happening today because there are immoral practices going on today that in the past people knew that what the Bible taught was just sinful. I mean, I can give you a, a short list here. Listen to this. And you can pick up on the fact that there are religious groups today who don't call these things sinful. And people have embraced it. And they'll just go to a group that says that, no, that's not sin. And so you can have a whole group over here that 
agree to go against what this says, but they've voted on it and they're in harmony. But it doesn't mean they're in fellowship with God. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul was very clear on this. He says in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. Well, religious groups might get, to get, might get together and say, well, we're not going to actually say or teach that, that they won't be able to inherit the kingdom of God just because they practice those things. We're not going to say it's, it's sinful. It might have been sinful in the past, but it's not sinful today. Or we as a congregation voted on it, and the majority of us have agreed that it's okay. Yes, people can do that. I'm not here to force anybody to believe anything. This program is just to impart Bible knowledge. We're just studying the Word. I don't really know how or why anybody would ever be upset with anything that I or we teach on this program if we give book, chapter, and verse. Because I don't want to get on here and preach my opinions. Right? I mean, what? We're not going to vote whether you can vote. No, it's, it's, it's ridiculous because the point is, the church doesn't belong to me. The church doesn't even belong to the church. Well, doesn't, doesn't the church belong to the church? To the people there? No, the, the church has a head. We already read the verse. The head of the church is Jesus. The church is the body. The body can have a head. We know that. Cut my head off. There's no other part of my body that can take over for the head. My thumb's not going to take over the thinking process. No. My elbow's not going to take over the... No, no, there's no other part of my body can replace the head or assume the position of the head. It just can't happen. When you think about the church that Jesus purchased with his own blood, and when we've read Colossians 1, which you can read a parallel passage over in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 and 23 where it says he's the head of the body which is the church so if jesus is the head and we are the body can the body vote on something my my arms and legs and rest of my body parts we're not going to vote against what the head decides to do i mean you could try can't succeed to be pleasing to the head that's what we're talking about today we're talking about the fact that can a church vote on some doctrinal issue and still be pleasing to God? We already know that groups can do that, but we're talking about and still be pleasing to God. Well, do we need to be pleasing to God? Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 6 points out that that really is our goal. We should be aiming to do what the the Lord wants us to do. Our, our God is the one who's in control. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But people are trying to seek God their own way. And they're saying, well, I, I want to do this and I also want to serve God. Well, you can't serve God in mammon. We have to make up our mind who we're going to serve. Just like Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, he says, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. He was going to choose to serve God. And if you and I say that we are going to serve God, that you're not, then you're not going to be a part of any group, any, any quote church that says, well, we're going to vote on this particular issue. You can't do that. In a passage we quote a lot on this program that deals specifically with this would be 2 John 9. Because 2 John 9 says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, he didn't say whoever doesn't abide in the doctrine of the church. 
I go to the Kirkwood Church of Christ, but I'm telling you folks, there's no Kirkwood Church of Christ doctrine. There's only the doctrine of Christ. The church follows the head, the teachings, the doctrine of Christ. He says here, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So where would any group of people get off thinking, well, we're going to go ahead and vote on whether we are going to accept this as sinful or not? Why would anybody do that? If, especially if they claim they want to be a part of the church that Jesus said he purchased with his own blood. And in order to be a part of that, we have to obey his gospel. Remember, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and on those who have not obeyed the gospel of Christ. So if, if you alter the gospel in such a way, it's not the gospel. And that's what Paul talked about in Galatians chapter 1. You and I need to walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1. You can read that in verses 3 through 7. We need to be in fellowship with God. And the only way you can be in fellowship with God is listening to what the Lord has to say. And in line with this, please remember Colossians 1 verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name. In the name means by the authority of. Do all in the name of Jesus Christ. So no, no, none of us have a right to legislate um, when you come and assemble with us. If you come and be with us and you observe what we do in worship, you observe what we're teaching and preaching, what we practice. If it's in violation of God's word, even though we may all agree, it's not pleasing to the Lord. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please him. We are here to please the Lord. Well, where's faith come from? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our goal, our goal is to study the word and abide in the word, walk in the light, walk by faith, not by sight. And when we do that, we can be pleasing to the Lord. And we all know why people want to vote on issues because they want to do what's the, what the majority will accept. And we have to be careful because the whole concept of voting is the majority rule. Haven't we learned from the biblical examples of what happens when you follow the majority? Go back to Noah's time. Were the majority right there? No, there was only eight people saved on the ark. When you think about when the Israelites went into the promised land and and they brought back information. They, they sent in 12 spies. Did they all agree? No. Only two of them said, we can go in and take the land. Ten of the spies said, no, we can't. You don't have to listen to the majority. And the Israelites listened to the majority. And so when we think about Judgment Day, Jesus talked about how that many are going to be lost in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Matter of fact, even in that same chapter, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he says even today, many are going down the broad way that leads to destruction and there's only a few on the narrow way. And so folks, you don't want to be following the majority, you're wanting to follow Jesus. And we offer so many things that you can take advantage of to study in the comfort of your own home to learn more about what we've talked about today. The free six lesson, just six. The free six-lesson home Bible study course, we'll mail it out to you. We put a return envelope with a stamp on it. So when you finish answering the questions, you put it in the envelope, it comes back. We just look it over. We check it over. And they're so easy. Rarely do people get things wrong. But if they get something wrong, we just point it out and say, you know, look at this verse again. And then we return it to you along with your next lesson. And the cool part about it is that there's no time limit on it. You work at it at your own speed. Love the fact when people say, can you send me a couple of lessons because I want to work on it with my husband or my wife or my son or daughter or a friend. And so please, if, if you would like to 
take advantage of that free home Bible study course. Just call that number and leave your name and your address. I really appreciate it when people are spelling their name that it's, if it's not common and um, their address. And if you would like that, please do that. Leave it on voicemail or text it. Also, people can be um, put on the mailing list for our weekly bulletin. So many in the community are getting that. Short sermons on paper. We also offer the, the two pamphlets that have gained a lot of interest in the St. Louis area. The 40 things that people think are in the Bible that are not, and the 30 things that are in the Bible which people are saying it's not. Those, those two pamphlets have stirred up a lot of interest, and I know they would be interest to you, but listen, they're free. There, there's no cost to that. And so if you would like us to throw that in with your first lesson, just go ahead and mention that. Now, we'd be amiss if we didn't mention the fact that we could also have a face-to-face -face Bible study. So many of our viewers have called up and said, Chuck, do you have a small Bible study group? And I'll say, yeah, we have some with women. During the week, we have some with men. We met uh, on, on Monday at 11 o'clock. Small group of men got together and studied some Bible study material. Some ladies would get together um, during the week on another day. And uh, you can join that class if you'd like. If you'd like your own personal study in the comfort of your own home, I've got a number of classes like that. I drive to their home and don't sit there and say, well, you know, Chuck would never come to my place. I'm, I'm not really in St. Louis. Folks, I've driven to many places, um, some over an hour away, and have weekly Bible studies with people who just want to learn the, the scriptures. And we open up the Bible, and that's all I bring, my Bible, and we study. And they invite friends or family members to join that study. If that's of interest to you, again, call the number, and we'll try to arrange a time that fits into your schedule. Sometimes it's in the weekend, a night during the week, during the morning sometimes, or in the afternoons. We're just trying to, to help you folks. That's what this program is all about. We're just trying to help people to become familiar with the Word of God because knowledge puts you in control of making sure that you're not being led astray. Is there false doctrine in the world? Of course there is. Is there religious division in this world? Of course there is. You want to make sure that you're right with the Lord. And as we often say, the only thing that will suffer from investigation is error. If you're a religious person and you believe in God and you love Jesus, listen, why would you be afraid to study the scriptures? If you take the course and, and you go through that and, and you believe this all along, it's just helping you to grow. And it doesn't hurt to study. Who studies too much? Folks, this has been brought to you by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at the corner of Big Ben and Geyer Road right there in Kirkwood. If you're in the area, please come and be with us Sunday mornings, 930, and then at 1030, and at 5 o'clock in the afternoons on Sundays, and a midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock. We have classes for all age groups. We'd love to have you come and be our honored guest. Tune in next week. We're going to open up our Bibles again, and we are going to study the Word. Thank you.